Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for another um, Team Mora chat. We love doing these every week. Um, it's a nice way for, for me to be able to connect with people um, in the district outside of my house. So I appreciate you all showing up, popping in and popping out, whichever you need to do. Um, tonight, our chat is um, going to be on the theme of mental health. So May is Mental Health Awareness Week. So we've been sort of posting some tips and um, just some resources on our Facebook page last week and this week. And then tonight we're going to have a little chat um, about what we can do for our own mental, mental health and for the mental health of our loved ones. So about eight weeks ago, as you know, our lives um, changed. Everyone's lives changed. For some of us, life came to a complete standstill and we adapted to sheltering at home. And all at once, the whirlwind of our regular lives with work and kids and carpools and meetings, it all stopped. And for others, um, this really unpredictable element of fear and anxiety has been added to their work lives. Um, some people carry an unbearably heavy burden. Um, essential workers who go to work every day with the fear for their health and for the health of their loved ones. All of us, whether we shelter at home or go out into the world to provide essential work, we were all yanked from our familiar routines and plunked down in the midst of this global pandemic. So the new reality of social distancing is really taking its toll on our mental health. The stress of balancing working from home and caring for loved ones and overseeing your child's distance learning, it's causing a lot of anxiety and depression. And that heavy burden that is carried by our essential workers um, can really cause some mental distress. So you may notice yourself or others around you are more edgy or irritable or angry. Um, people feel helpless, nervous and anxious, hopeless or sad. And um, we're here tonight to talk about those things. And so people know that, they're, that you are not alone. Uh, this is something that we should all talk about it's we need to protect our mental health during this stressful and ever-changing situation. So we wanna recognize our feelings tonight and um, talk about them, give you some tips and some resources, and we're going to treat our mental health like our physical health, check in with ourselves just like we do with doctor's checkups. So tonight I have two really special guests who are friends of mine. Um, some of my most trusted resources are the smart women I have met um, in the community. So I am really excited to welcome Annie Barsh, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She has been a therapist for the past 15 years at Centennial Counseling, which is a private practice. She is the director of the Sandwich Office, and her specialties are PTSD, suicide, grief, addiction, parenting, and couples. And second, we will be just joined by Gabby Laboda, who has been working with students, children and adolescents since 1999, when she was an at-risk counselor in the East Aurora School District. She continued with her education and received a master's in social work in 2003 and started a career with the Department of Juvenile Justice, where she received her license as a social worker and then her clinical social work license, which she currently holds today. After 13 years working at the Youth Center in St. Charles, she started working with the West Aurora School District and works at the middle, a middle school and now at Hall Elementary School as a school social worker. So I'm so excited to have these friends and mental health professionals join us today. Welcome. Hi, Annie. Hi, thank you. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Maura. So Hi, good Annie. to see you. Thank you for coming. Sure, so. Real quickly, let's just, how are both of you? You know, I know you're both working from home and you both have kids, to, you both have little ones at home too. So how how are you doing? Yeah, I thought of that this morning that all three of us have teenagers and toddlers and that says a lot right there. <laughs> it is, that's crazy, we do. Yeah. We do. Um, Hanging in there. Again, there's the up days and the down days. And um, whenever the weather's nice, that certainly helps. Um, yeah. So doing the best we can and, and really just trying to focus on like what needs to happen today. Yes. Focus on the present. Definitely. How about you, Gabby? 
Yeah, I would say the same. Um, just really trying to focus on what's in the here and now and, um, you know, just taking it with what we need to get done. You know, school's coming to an end, so that's a success and um, getting outside, enjoying the weather. Yeah. Taking care of ourselves. Yeah. As, as we can. It makes all the difference. That sunshine and movement for our kids mm -hmm. and ourselves makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. So yes. let's um, start off tonight by demystifying therapy. Oh, I forgot we have a mental health check-in. This is good. So if you're just joining us on Facebook, if you want to, no pressure, um, but tell us how you're feeling today. A red heart means you're doing well. Green, you're doing all right. Yellow, I've been better. Blue, I'm not okay. And if you're feeling blue today, I want you to know that we are here to recognize that. We are here to give some um, advice and offer some resources for you. And we will check back in with you if you are feeling that blue heart today. Um, I personally would say I'm green, but how about you all? <laughs> how are you, Gabby? What color heart are you today? Yeah, I'm I'm green. Yeah. Oh, I see Tori. Tori is a green. Good. That's a nice, solid place. How about you, Annie? You know, I'm greenish. Um, yeah. I go between green and yellow. Um, my, I, I may have shared, I think both of you know this, but the audience may not. My mom has dementia. And so, of course, this adds another layer of difficulty right now with her being kind of locked in a facility in very little contact. So that also kind of influences how I'm doing day to day in Mother's Day. Made it a little challenging. Yes, it sure does. Us. So we are caretakers not only for our children, but for our parents as well. So I can imagine, have you had contact with her phone wise or does she yeah. do any technology? On the phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just a yeah. lot of explaining what's going on in the world again and again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's hard. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are in that similar situation with their parents. Yeah. I see a lot of green hearts up there from Diane and Abby. Hi, everyone. Yay. All right, so let's uh, start off by demystifying therapy for us. So um, tell us what, a, so Annie, you are a therapist. Tell us what a therapy session is traditionally like before sheltering in place. Um, some people feel like it could be a scary thing or so huh? and pull the curtain back for us. Yeah. I would say most people who come in absolutely have some anxiety about not knowing what to expect. I think there's a lot of cliches that come from TV and movies and whatnot. Some of the negative ones are, oh, I'm going to come and be judged for all the wrongdoing or the way I don't have my life together or other ideas of you're going to tell me what to do with my life. Um, and really what therapy is, is a, it's a safe place of non-judgment where you come. And I think for a lot of people just kind of process what's happening in the world around them, the feelings about that, their relationships, their goals, what's going well, what's not. I, I, I make this analogy with clients that when you're putting together a puzzle, how much harder is it when you don't kind of have that picture in front of you? And I think in therapy, it's like you're a piece of the puzzle and we as the therapist help you kind of see the picture and it, it makes it so much easier to navigate when you have that big picture. And I'd like to yeah. ask. Yeah, I like that. I could definitely agree with all that. Um, I like to think about, you know, meeting the clients where they're at. So everyone's coming in this situation um, with different things on their plate. Um, Annie mentioned non, non judgmental attitude um, and just really being present with the individual. Um, so I think that's important for people to know that. Um, you know, therapists are there to meet you where you're at and, and help you, guide you to where you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it so less scary that way. It's a, I like meeting you where you're at and showing, helping you see the big picture. Um, mm -hmm. Not even just showing it to you, but how you have to see it yourself. So you guide us in that. Yeah. yeah. So share why it is important Um to maintain good mental health and maybe to treat our mental health like we do our physical health. So I, I like to think that, um, you know, prevention is key for anything. And just like you asked, you know, at the beginning of this webinar um, that, you know, for people to check in and making sure we're checking in with ourselves, um, that's doing mental health. You're, you're doing a little self-assessment 
Um, and we all need to kind of take that moment to reflect um, as often as we can remember to um, and figure out different strategies to kind of help us get back to a good working place. Um, so it's absolutely essential. I mean, it, it impacts our physical health. It impacts mm -hmm. um, our our social relationships, it impacts our academic functioning, our work functioning. So it's not a separate entity. It's, you know, it's, it's who we are. It's part of, mm -hmm. right. So um, we have to treat it as that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I would echo that. It's, it's a foundational piece, you know, like when we're in, in order to function, we need to feel safe and both safe physically and emotionally. I, I often refer to Maslow's hierarchy of needs of kind of we can't move forward in doing some of the higher level things we need to do if our mind is somewhere else worried about things with anxiety or I mean, an anxiety, depression kind of cycle through each other. I'm anxious and then I can't function and then I'm not functioning. So then I get more worried. And um, again, having that foundational piece of stability of just feeling well enough to function, you build upon that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, people who are caretakers in, in their lives, I mean, not just mothers, but people who are just have that caretaking role sometimes feel like it's selfish to focus inward. Um or maybe that's just me sometimes. Like I um, spend a lot of my time focusing outward on children and on other people around me and fo taking time to focus inward can feel selfish, but it's not. It's taking care of myself so I can then take care of the people that I need to take care of. So um, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, we I mentioned in the beginning, you know, sheltering in place and um, being solitary and away from people can lead to a lot of different feelings of depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. um, just nervousness. Can, can you tell us about some common signs that someone that we love or ourselves may be struggling with in their mental health? What should we be looking for? Yeah, I often will tell people, um, specifically with the depression, you kind of look at, are you operating on either end of the spectrum? Or are you sleeping too much or are you not sleeping enough? Are you eating too much or not eating enough? Um, are, with that piece, it's really like, how are you functioning? Are you able to do the things you need to do? Where's your head at? Where's your mind at? Um, now the pandemic makes it challenging because there's a lot of, a lot of us, I would say most of us have kind of shifted into survival mode and when it goes back to like, what do I have to do? Um, because we are just feeling overwhelmed and heavy. And so there's kind of, there's even this concept of temporary depression and temporary situational anxiety versus clinical anxiety and depression. So I think at the very least people are experiencing that. Yeah. Is, and I think I know your answer to this question, but if you're having situational depression and anxiety, is it absolutely okay to reach out to, to therapy and to get that help you need for that moment, even if it might not be a clinical situation? Absolutely. That's a, yes. at least 50% of the people I think that come. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that's good to good for everyone to know that it, you don't have to feel um, so deep down inside in a hole. Just go get the help you need right now, and then you yeah. can be healthy and move forward. Yeah, a lot of people, and I'll just interject this quickly. A lot of people feel like, oh, I have to be on the edge to justify therapy. And there's this reality of like, if you come to therapy, sometimes we can help you prevent getting to the edge or right. over the edge. Right. And that's what we want. We don't want to be on the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And your question, more too, about um, signs and symptoms when we think about children and adolescents. Yeah you know, a drastic shift in, you know, how they usually are. And, and I mean, you have to take that also um, understanding development of children and adolescents. Um, but, you know, are they not participating in things like they used to um, finding joy or um, pleasure and, you know, previously liked activities. And, you know, Annie, you know, mentioned the pandemic and, you know, I think a lot of children right now are struggling with, not enjoying things that they used to enjoy yeah because like the world's just kind of it's such an uneasy place um so i think we know our children the best and um 
you know, if, if someone's seeing a drastic shift and it lasts, you know, a long time and, um, or there's any, you know, thoughts or communication about self-harm or anything like that, then those are definite reasons to reach out um, mm -hmm. for extra assistance. Yes. And, and as a parent, I know this is a little further down on our line, but as a parent, if you're seeing that, who would you reach out to? You know, um, would you reach out to your school social worker or? Um, I think definitely um, school social worker is a great resource, especially now. Um, you know, I'm connecting with more families probably now than I had when we were in the school building. Um, so that's definitely a resource, not just now, but always. Um, you know, family and friends, you know, mm -hmm. kind of help kind of be someone to troubleshoot with. Um, but if you think it's more more significant, um, and Annie might be able to speak to this a little bit more, I mean, you you can go through um, your insurance and see what, you know, they provide for, and where they would provide services. Um, and there are so many services in the Fox Valley area, uh, mm -hmm. a lot. So there, there are lots of options. Um, yeah. And we have some numbers down on the bottom of our screen that um, scrolling across the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, it, that's always available and Suicide Prevention Services and Batavia is wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, um, and those are 24 seven line. Sorry. Um, yeah. And they will help you figure out, you know, where to go from there. Yeah. 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 I was going to add, we're all helpers by nature. And so whether it be our clinicians or support staff, if someone calls up and our insurance is, we're not on your insurance panel or we're full and we're not able to get you in, we always share resources. And, and we're also, you know, we're going to work with people to problem solve and find them a place that can help them. No one's really going to ever be left hanging if you reach out to a professional. Yes, that's really good to know because I know insurance is always, we don't want that to be a barrier for your physical or mental health. It should not be a barrier. You should get what the services that you need. Mm -hmm. And right. offline, I was talking about um, a law in Illinois that passed um, maybe a year ago. It's called the Firearm Restraining Order. And if we're talking about um, signs and symptoms to be on the lookout for, I think it's important for people to know that if um, someone you love or someone you live with or even a roommate um, that you live with is showing signs of self-harm, um, talking about hurting themselves or others, uh -huh. and they own a firearm, you can go to the police department and um, get something called a firearm restraining order. And um, it, it goes through the court system, but if it is granted, then the uh, police will come and collect the weapons from that person for a specific amount of time. So they won't lose their FOID card forever. Um, they won't lose their guns forever. They will be held in the sh at the sheriff's office, but um, sheriff's department. But it, I think it's a really great resource for people, especially right now, because um, firearm by suicide is always fatal. Um, and it's something that we should be thinking about. So they, if you need information on that, please go to speakforsafetyillinois.org. Um, it's a good place to find that. Um, so we could talk a little bit about um, teletherapy. So Annie, your life as a therapist has changed a lot. And Gabby, what you do with the students has changed a lot since you're not doing in-person things. So um, first, just tell us what it was like to start working from home. Did you have to take any steps to change your um, office at home or what, you know, what was that like for you? Well, first and foremost, with three kids, I had to find a place that could be consistently quiet and secure. Yeah. Um, we, use, we already use a HIPAA compliant platform, but just being in my own environment. So I move, go into a bedroom and I lock the door. Um, and then um, yeah, the shift was really um, working people through the anxiety. I think it helps when you have this pre-existing relationship and you can kind of pick up where you, where you left off. But I I think in the beginning too, there was just uh, um, the awkwardness of like people not knowing what to expect. Anytime there's an unknown, you worry about what it's going to be like. And and so I, I would even explain to the therapist I'm supervising like the first five minutes will feel a little weird, and then you'll get into it, and you'll be it'll be like you're back in the room. 
Right. It, body language a little harder, um, but th- th- I think you just ask more questions, you know, like, you seem flat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What is that about? Yeah. In, yeah. Have you done any um, counseling sessions with your students, Gabby? So we um, we can set up Zoom chats. Like I think a lot of school districts are using that. Um, and yes, I have done that with some groups. Um, I reach out. We do work through Seesaw. Um, that's the, the forum that our district uses. Um, so, you know, you can send personal messages to parents um, and I have classrooms that I'm a, a part of and I have my caseload. Um, and then it really, I offered it to any class if they wanted me to be a part of their learning um, to kind of just provide uh, coping strategies, um, mindfulness activities, um, or just a resource. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely been, um, it's been different, yeah. um, but you know, it, it, you just have to be creative and um, you just try to reach out. And uh, I was attending a webinar today and they were mentioning how as therapists, um, the feedback they've received from families, even if they're not responding to like check-ins, mm-hmm. how, how appreciative it is. And so that was encouraging to hear That's good. Uh-huh. because oftentimes, you know, in my district, um, some families, they, they have just different struggles. Um, and so it's just nice to, to think that, okay, so they probably got my message and maybe just couldn't respond and that's okay. Right. Um, and hopefully they had the same thought that these other people were sharing, um, that it's been encouraging. Um, Cause really the connection is, has been the biggest focus for staying connected. Yeah, yeah, just exactly. staying connected and yeah. keeping that relationship. Um, yeah. So, and on that same thought, does teletherapy have to be a Zoom call? Can it be a phone call um, or even an email? I don't know if that's a thing. If if you email sure. people back and forth, but for us, I can say specifically, um, right now, insurance companies are covering the platform of telehealth or phone. Um, okay. Usually phone is not covered at all. Telehealth typically is, um, point of origin changes. Usually email is not a great way to do therapy because again, right. as, you, as anybody could know with texting and email, there's a lot to be inferred and it's hard to know tone and things like that. Yeah. Um, and we let clients know that emails are part of their records. So it's, it's a way to like, usually that's used for scheduling and appointments and things like that, or just like little bits of information, but not clinical stuff. Sure. Sure. And hopefully, um, would you like to see telehealth remain um, something you do or or at least covered by insurance for insurance purposes? And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think of a lot of situations where it's relevant. We've had clients that have surgery and they can't leave the house for a period of time. And sometimes they have to go without. I think specifically of a couple of clients I've worked with for five years through their teens and they go off to college and it's right. really hard for them. That's a huge transitional time in life. It's hard for them to start over with a new person. Um, and telehealth would allow me to continue to work with some of those kids when they go away to college. So I think there are absolutely benefits. I mean, certainly one-to-one or being in person is fantastic, but there are always going to be situations where it could be ideal to have other options. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, checking in with your college age clients. I mean, that would be just so beneficial uh-huh. for them, I think, because that's a tough transition from high school to college. That's that's a Huge. time where you need as much support as you can get. Yeah. And what about if a person has never been to therapy before, but, but right now is feeling like they need help and support? Is it okay to start with right now with telehealth or, you know, tell us about that. Yeah, we do have therapists doing intakes um, for the very same reason. It's like sometimes something happens and it's just, I need this help and the support right now. And I think, again, it flows pretty naturally. You get the first session is usually a lot of questions of like, Hey, I want to learn about you and your world and the people that are important to you and your goals and your struggles. And so that Q and a allows you to really get to know a person. And then you go from there. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's great. I hope that um, people feel that they can reach out right now. I think it's important that people know that intakes are still happening. And um, for some people, it might even be um, less intimidating to do telehealth, you know, you know, might be less to you know, drive into an office. And I know you don't lay down on a couch, but sit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So has your caseload increased or has it stayed pretty steady? Are you working more, Annie, now than you used to? Or um, It's pretty steady. It's just kind of spread out. So yeah. um, with my husband being a teacher, he had certain hours that he had was required. And then I just kind of took my caseload. I was working three longer days and spread it out among the week, um, kind of overlapping with the baby's nap too, like it worked. Whatever was working, it's nice to have that flexibility. And it's nice because clients have that flexibility too. So many people are at home or working from home. So um, yeah, it's been good. Yeah. And Gabby, I know you've done some webinars and stuff. Have you, do you have any tips for how um, a client can stay, um, have privacy during during a telehealth session? I know in my case, maybe it would be hard to find a quiet space where I felt comfortable. Have you learned any tips or anything about that? Um, and I think we had chatted about this, about, you know, sometimes they excuse themselves from the house and they go into the car. Um, yeah. But also just, you know, having that open dialogue, I think, with their therapist and that relationship to where they could say, you know what, this isn't going to work right now. We need to reschedule. Um, and, you know, that that that's a piece to their life is is, you know, what is going on and why is it hard for them to to get that um, that privacy? A long time. Yeah, so that is another thing to explore with them. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, maybe there are family therapy options that might be necessary at times. Yeah. I was also thinking about maybe adolescents who need privacy from their parents and their siblings in a, in a therapy session in that setting. So have what are people doing, you know, for that privacy? Um, I would imagine, I would hope that you know, there would be some honest conversation within the family. Um, and I know that's not always, you know, some, we, we think our family is our biggest support, but sometimes that's not. Um, but just the respect that this is important and that everyone views the therapy session as, um, as essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Annie probably has more like live experience with that. Yeah. I've had teenagers go out on the deck, go out in their car. I've had someone do a session in the bathroom. It's like whatever it takes to get mm -hmm. privacy. Yeah. Um, but I do like the flexibility piece. I'll throw in a lot of practices, not just ours. A lot that I've talked to during this period of time are suspending their kind of no show late cancel fees because life is so unpredictable. Yeah. I, I, I had a, a mother once, I know she has like two kids under the age of four and we were supposed to meet. I usually check in like, Hey, I'm going to hop online in five minutes. And she was like, listen, I have a rare opportunity to take a nap. Can we reschedule? <laughs> That's and wonderful. Like, yeah. yeah. We, she got her nap and we rescheduled. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. I love that, that that's happening because mm -hmm. we, we really do need flexibility and we need to give grace to everybody right now. Give ourselves grace and give the people, our coworkers grace Our yeah. So I love that. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any other tips or suggestions for teletherapy or a smooth transition to teletherapy? Or do you think we've covered it? I think, I think we're pretty good. Yeah, I think there's a yeah. lot of flexibility. Usually it can work on your phone, a tablet, or a laptop. So there's just a lot of options. Yeah, yeah. The, the biggest barrier is not usually technology. It's usually Wi-Fi. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think a big a, something that's weighing sort of heavily on our minds as parents and um, other people is um, the mental health of our children. So, um, Gabby, tell us a little bit about um, what you do in the schools and and how you are supporting kids now. So, what does a school social worker do? <laughs> that's probably a huge question. <laughs> um. So providing individual and group counseling services to students, um, crisis intervention, working with teachers, um, really you're there to you know respond to any need within the building. Um, 
So, I mean, I have a caseload of students I am obligated to see um, by law. Um, and then anyone else is, you know, it's just like coming in for therapy if they're having a family um, issue or they're really struggling in school. Um, then they might, you know, and you know, end up being on my caseload. Um, or some social issues, maybe with mm -hmm. or things, things like that. If you have time to help with social issues in school, do you do that? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so you know, typically you try to figure out what's going on before something you know erupts. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a busy place, and there's lots of students. Uh, my school is, you know, six hundred plus. So. Um, and yeah, there's, there's relationships, there's dynamics within the classroom, there's history that we don't even know about sometimes that comes into the school building. Um, there's community issues. Um, so, you know, flexibility and having resources. Um, one thing that our district does is we, we have, um, an outside agency, um, communities and schools that comes into our school, um, and provides counseling. So oh, that's nice. it's really up to the social worker to kind of get that linked and started. But um, we were able, I think this past year, to have about 12 to 14 students with the therapist um, that would come in weekly. Oh, what a great resource. That's really- It is. Yeah. It is a great resource. So, you know, as we transition to, you know, remote learning, um, just staying connected with them has really been my goal. and. Um, you know, I'll check their teacher's um, seesaw page and if they've done some work, uh, make a comment so they know that, you know, I'm I'm still here and- um, Yeah, Mrs. Lobota is still thinking of you and yeah. yeah, that can mean a lot. That can make a difference in someone's day, I think, when they know that mm -hmm. you're- And the social them. workers are such good advocates. It's like, you guys are so often the bridge. Like kids are talking to you about what is going on outside of school and at home. And when they're struggling in class, you can really help teachers know better, mm -hmm. like what's reasonable to expect from that student or how they may be acting with all of those outside variables. Yeah. 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 Like you're good with the analogies. You are a bridge. <laughs> I'm full of analogies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. So Gabby, what changes are you seeing in your students or, Maybe even we can just talk about some changes we're seeing in our own children um, as we navigate um, eight plus weeks of no social interactions. Um, you know, I, that's hard to say. I mean, honestly, um, I think what will be interesting is when we return back to, you know, quote unquote normal. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's when I'm really going to be able to see and figure out what is going on because I think there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that, um, you know, parents are just doing the best that they can yeah. um, with what they have. And, you know, the kids are too. So um, I would hope because I am putting myself out there as a resource that, you know, families feel comfortable, but, you know, I can only respond when they you kind of, you know, respond back to me. Um, I really don't see much change with the students that I work with, yeah. um, which, you know, is, is good. Sure. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, within my own home, you know, there's, there's frustration, there's um, irritability. So I can only imagine that those things are also happening in, you know, in other people's homes. Yeah. Um, as they, you know, the kids don't quite understand what's going on. Yeah. And at a, at a little earlier age with teenagers, I would throw in one of the things that I think becomes so hard is teenagers, as we know, don't really look to their parents for their acceptance and worth and whatever, yeah. and, but really their peers. And so I see so many teenagers struggling with identity. Like who am I in this void of having my friends around me to tell me what I like mm -hmm. and who I am and where we're going and what we're doing. It's almost just this free flow, mm -hmm. like, loss of identity. Yeah, that's so interesting. I never thought about that, but they're really disconnected from that. And then maybe connected to an un, an unreal reality in social media, an un, I can't sure. think of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the reality they're seeing from their friends right now is not always real, right? On the social media and all that stuff. So navigating that um, for adolescents and teens must be hard. Yeah. Um, so, and we were also thinking about um, with the older kids, college kids who have had to come back home, um, learn from home, you know, do their college courses at home or learn how to live with their parents again when they've been having a lot of freedom at college. So that must be a struggle. Do you see any of that, Annie? Or Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, especially towards the end of their college years, feeling like they're, they're going to be behind in life. Like this, like college graduation, we all remember being that age. It's like college graduation is the starting line. This is when my life starts and all these things are going to happen. And now I'm going to be behind. And so again, there's so much shifting perspective of like, okay, like big picture, is there yeah. really a starting line? Some people have false starts, you know. Like yeah, yeah. 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 I, I end up telling most of my clients, I went to college initially to be a chef, and here I am as a therapist. <laughs> so I <laughs> didn't even know that. Yeah. Wow. We, how come you haven't invited me over for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take all the plans. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point of feeling like your life is on pause, so you're falling behind. But really, all of our lives, are on pause right now. Um, and we will all get started and get moving together. So what are some signs that your child might be struggling with mental health? What are some things that we should look out for? So I think, you know, when we think about who they are day to day, if we're seeing some shifts, um, you know, like Annie had mentioned earlier, the sleep habits, eating habits, um, you know, loss of interest in things, um, more irritability than what's to be expected at their age level. Um, and this would be something that would continue for a while. Sure. Not talking just a couple days, but a couple weeks. Um, so. Yeah. And any, any talk of self, self-harm, as we said, is something that we should immediately seek help and support for. Sure. Um, that's really important. And I think it's important um, at this point to pause for a moment and just talk about, as I talked about with the firearm restraining order, um, something that can really help um, our kids living in homes with guns is a program that's called Be Smart for Kids. And it's important to recognize the role that firearms play in suicide, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And how much of a difference we can make um, in those fire, suicide by firearm attempts if we secure our guns in our homes. So that means um, storing them locked, um, locking them up unloaded in your ammunition in another place. Mm -hmm. Because I think kids and adolescents, um, they're really smart and they know where firearms are in your house. Like, this is something I think about a lot, um, the graphic that's on the screen. Um, you should just always assume that your children or your teens can find your guns and make sure that they are locked and unloaded and ammunition separate because mm -hmm. that's the hugest way to mitigate the risk of firearm by suicide or accidental shootings. So we're all stuck at home. We're all feeling isolated and anxious. So this is something that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I just read a report that those, that accidental deaths by firearm has gone up during the lockdown. Yeah, that is so scary to me. Um, I, just that sentence, assume that children and teens can find your guns. I think that everyone should just be at that baseline because um, we wanna keep our kids safe. They're naturally curious, um, impulsive, and it's up to us to keep them safe. So I think that's a good stat. And if you're interested in more information, you can go to besmartforkids.org um, is a great website for um, tips and tools to keep your firearm safe in your house. Um, so let's see, how about some resources for parents? So we're on the lookout for how our kids are doing. Um, what can we do to foster some healthy child development if um, our kids are feeling anxious? And, you know, we'll, we'll go get supports from mental health professionals if we need them. But what are some things we as parents can do around the home to support our children's mental health? 
so I think, you know, self-care for yourself is important. Um, but as children are exploring with parents about how they're feeling, um, you know, just really listening, um, not trying to always have the answer, um, asking yourself, am I listening to respond or am I listening to really understand what they're saying? Um, you know, you mentioned college students and, um, you know, oh, well, maybe for a parent, it's like, well, you don't get to go to your college graduation or a high school graduation. Well, but for that child, that could be really significant. Um, so really, you know, listening and kind of meeting them where they're at, um, I think is is a good way to see kind of where things are at for them um, yeah. to kind of, you know, how to navigate. And And I would say, you just hit two things on the head for me is that if I don't take care of myself, it's hard for me to listen and mm -hmm. not just respond. Mm -hmm. you know, the moments when I'm most tired and feeling most emotionally depleted are the moments where I don't mm -hmm. really listen to my kids. I just say, whatever, go turn <laughs> on. Or, so that's really important. I cannot be a good listener for my kids if I don't take care of myself. And then really understand where it's coming from when my fifth grader says she's going to miss her fifth grade breakfast or you know, what she says is I'm not going to get a donut this year. And I say, are you kidding me? We have donuts all the time, but that's not what she really means. Mm -hmm. She means right. she's missing that conclusion to fifth grade mm -hmm. and that celebration and that closure. So that's important. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Validation goes a long way. So listening and then validating what you're hearing, whether you, I tell people all the time, validating doesn't mean you agree with it. It means you hear it. Right. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things I've done with kids, and I actually did this with my own kids when they were little, um, because kids aren't always as good with words as we are. They each had a journal and they could write or draw whatever they wanted. And there was a rule like you will never get in trouble for what's in this journal. Um, and there would be times one brother would be mad at the other and he he drew a picture of himself kind of strangling his brother. And it's like, okay, let's talk about this. He wasn't violent and he wasn't aggressive, but he was angry. And you think mm -hmm. about adults sometimes, like, I'm so mad I could kill them. It's a, it's, it's a way we're talking about our feelings with a level of intensity. Kids don't have those words. So they're drawing, you know, and, and so as parents, again, if we give our kids that opportunity, like, hey, you have a journal, write or draw whatever you want. Can we sit with that? Um, intensity and help them find the words and walk through the words of it um, and realize it's it's not literal. Yeah. And sit with the intensity. Don't shut it down. Don't, right. If, right. if the emotions are uncomfortable, we have to teach ourselves and our kids to live with those uncomfortable emotions to, you know, to learn yeah. and to yeah, fix it. Yeah. 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 A journal. That's a great thing to start a journal right now for your kids. Yeah. What else? Getting outside is always good. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, movement. Any movement. other tips? Maybe? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's breathing exercises. There's, you know, mindfulness, yoga. Um, you know, figuring out what kind of will stick with your child. You might need to do lots of different things and really encourage. Maybe you'll need to do it with them. Um, art. That's a great um, a great, great resource, um, because it's coming from you and it's, it's yours. Um, but I, you know, in, I think connecting with your kids really, um, in this time and just trying to, um, set aside what you feel like you need to do and just kind of be with them in the moment. Um, yeah, that's sometimes the hardest thing, but it's important. You really do a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love this graphic, the 50 mm -hmm. um, coping tools for kids. It's a, it's a nice visual reminder of small things you can do throughout the day. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm like looking at the blocks and just taking 20 minutes in between zoom calls to build some towers with Teddy mm -hmm. um, will help me connect with him and help me. It's therapeutic to build towers sometimes, you know, um, it's therapy for us both. Or we've done those doodle with Mo, the drawing with Mo, mm -hmm. which for me, sometimes I feel like too stressed out to be creative. I don't know, you know, like draw a picture. I'm like, I'll draw a stick person. I don't know. But if I have 
I don't know, Bob Ross or someone coaching me through it. It is like a <laughs> mind flowing thing. So that's been a fun way uh -huh. to sort of de-stress and come down. Yeah. Any other resources to, to throw out there? You know, I would just highlight too, you know, we're our children's first role models. So how we're handling the stress, um, Mm -hmm. to pick up on that and yeah. it's okay to be stressed it's okay to cry it's okay to have those intense feelings um i think it's healthy right now to have those and and explore them and share them with your children mm -hmm. i mean you know yeah standing limits but um and then letting them see how you handle it how yeah. do you what are your coping mechanisms? Um, because they're watching you and what you do um, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing I would throw in, this is probably, again, also for maybe little older middle school, high school kids, so much of what they've lost is their ability to control anything. I mean, we all have lost the ability, the ability to control a lot of things. So finding ways they can have some control, like, hey, you guys mm -hmm. want to pick the dinner this day? Or do you guys want to mm -hmm. pick the game we play? Or do you want to pick the movie we watch? Like giving them little ways they can make a choice and have some control just feels good. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Choices are important. Choices are important. That is right. That is mm -hmm. right. Well, we are coming down to the end. It's hard to believe, but we've been talking for 45 minutes, but it's been a nice um, chat. So. I think we've, um, you know, we've put some phone numbers and websites in the comment section. So if people are looking for resources in in the 49th district to help, um, I think we just put up a veterans crisis line, which is something we didn't even touch on in this. Um, is really um, something a whole other chat that we could talk about. And there's some alcohol and drug abuse helplines, and again, we didn't even touch on that. Um, we really were focusing on um, children's mental health and our self-care and getting to know teletherapy. So I just want to thank you both so much um, for giving your time. I know how busy you are, but taking some time out um, to talk to us. And um, that's it. Any other parting words wrapping up? No, thanks thank for you. Doing it. it is. It's really important to, mm -hmm. yeah, to remember to focus on these kinds of things. Yeah. Now. I think so too. Yeah. And um, this, I'm going to segue to just remind team Mora that we have a mask up challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be competitive for one second, but we have been challenged by candidate Martha Paschke and candidate Jamie Mosser to make some masks over Memorial day weekend. So mm -hmm. check out our Facebook page and our website, if you want to help us, win the challenge and the, if we win the challenge that just means we make extra masks for our community and that's a good thing for everybody so um i'll leave you all with that but thank you so much i hope you both have a great weekend i think it's going to be a nice day tomorrow all right yes looking forward to it thank yes. you so much yeah all right bye annie bye gabby bye all right, I'll sign off to everybody. Thank you for joining us. It was a really good chat with some really wonderful um, mental health professionals. So don't be afraid to um, take care of yourselves and take care of your loved ones. So stay healthy and um, stay well and enjoy sunshine tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>